Good morning, everyone. Welcome to LEBC online gathering this morning. You are welcome if you're watching us here now, but you're welcome as well if you're watching us back later during the week or later today. Uh, thanks very much to Chris for sharing his uh, uh, photos and um, some of the verses that are on there. I'm just going to say some hellos to some of the people in the chat. So good morning to Julian. Good morning to the Hogs. Good morning to Jeremy and Shirley. Good morning to Pauline. Hello to the VDMs. Hello to Fab and Rima. Morning to Dorothea. Hello to Ruth and Steve. Hello to Cynthia. Hello to Anne and Hannah. Good morning to Don and Kay. Morning to the Siemens. Morning to Ruth and family. Morning to Penny Lynn and family. Morning to Angie. Morning to the Lloyds. You're all so welcome, and it's so good to hear that you're here with us worshipping. Um, are you coming in, Michael? Yeah. We're going to start our time with some worship together. And as we're preparing, I've been reading some psalms. I found a good one. Psalm 98. Sing to God a brand new song. He made a world of wonders. He rolled up his sleeves. He, th he set things right. God made history with salvation. He showed the world what he could do. He remembered to love us. A bonus to his dear family, Israel, indefatigable love. The whole earth comes to attention. Look, God's work of salvation. Shout your praises to God, everyone. Let loose and sing. Strike up the band. Round up the orchestra to play for God. Add on a hundred voice choir. Feature trumpets and big trombones. Fill the air with praises to King God. Let the sea and its fish give a round of applause with everything living on earth joining in. Let ocean breakers call out encore and mountains harmonize the finale. A tribute to God when he comes, when he comes to set the earth right. He'll straighten the world out. He'll put the world right and everyone in it. We gather together to worship this God this morning. Please join with us. Just gonna try and get the words ready. So in your homes, stand with us as we sing and worship God together. I suggest you turn the volume up so you don't feel too self-conscious singing along. We're going to sing All God's Children Rejoice. to connect we've got this uh, remote control software that enables us to control the words that you can see on the screen which is wonderful technology to have it was connected just before we started looks like we didn't practice we actually practiced all of this this morning it's logged itself out are we going from there here we go, go we're the going 
every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Every knee will bow before him. So open up the gates. So open up the gates. Make way before the King of Kings. The God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring. Every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains. Every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow. Stop the Lord Almighty. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Sing it over the battle. Who can stop? Stop the Lord. Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains. Every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Every knee will bow before. Lord, thank you that we can gather this morning, that we can bring our worship and our praise to you. Lord, I pray that you will use this time to speak to us um, individually, that we will hear your voice speaking to us through the worship, through the prayer times, through um, what Keith comes to bring us in just a moment. Lord, I pray that you will reveal something of you new to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. We're heading over to the story next. Um, this is created for us by the VDM, thank, VDM family. Thank you very much. Um, it's called The Baby Who Sailed the Nile. And we're heading over there now. The Baby Who Sailed the Nile. Adapted from the Link It Up Bible by Bob Hartman. Joseph and his brothers thrived in Egypt. They had children and their children had children and their children after them. God's promise to Abraham was definitely coming true. Hundreds of years passed. Then a pharaoh came to the throne of Egypt who no longer remembered Joseph and what he had done to save the Egyptian people. All that pharaoh saw were Hebrews. Hebrews everywhere and that frightened him. So pharaoh made the Hebrews his slaves. Pharaoh orders all his people. If you see a Hebrew baby boy, throw them in the Nile. Now there was a Hebrew woman, sent it from Joseph's brother Levi, who was determined 
that her child would not die. So when she gave birth to her son, she did her best to hide him. But babies grow big and babies grow noisy. And when three months had passed, she could see him no longer. She built him a little basket boat made of bulrushes. She covered it with sticky bitumen and pitch. Then she put her boy in the basket and set it floating among the reeds on the river, on the banks of the river Nile. She sent her daughter to hide on the bank and keep watch over the basket and the boy. One day, Pharaoh's daughter decided to bathe in the river. She spotted the basket and sent her serving girls to fetch it. And when she opened it, what a surprise! Trembling, the boy's sister watched helplessly. The baby began to cry and Pharaoh's daughter felt sorry for him. It's a Hebrew child! As she held him and as she cuddled him. I know a Hebrew woman who could nurse him for you! Shouted his sister, emerging from the reeds. Pharaoh's daughter commanded, Fetch her girl! The girl returned with her mum. Nurse this child for me. I will pay you for your trouble. And when he no longer needs your milk, bring him back to me and I will bring him up as my son. And seeing as I pulled him up out of the water, that is what I will call him. Little pulled up, little Moses. The end. Good morning. Good morning. It's great to have you with us this morning. And thank you to, uh, for that amazing story. Wasn't that a beautiful retelling of the story of Moses. Now, uh, I don't know about you, but I tend to think of the story of Moses as being one of those really uh, cute stories that we uh, perhaps have heard in childhood or we would tell to our children. And yet, actually, it's a story that's set in the midst of one of the deepest, darkest times for the people of Israel. We might think that we're going through difficult times at the moment. Uh, this winter period with lockdown and uh, pandemic has been really difficult. But actually, it's, it almost pales in comparison with the difficulties the people of God were facing. The Israelites were effectively imprisoned in Egypt. And as we begin the book of Exodus, where our beautifully retold story was from this morning, their situation is getting worse and worse and worse. We might very well ask ourselves, how did things get this bad? Last week, if you were with us last week or watched uh, online last week, uh, you'll know that Joseph was reunited with his family and they all moved to be with him in Egypt. Joseph and his brothers and that generation passed on. But the Israelites increased in numbers and were told became so numerous that the land was filled with them. Egypt had originally welcomed Joseph's family. The people of Egypt owed Joseph a huge debt. He had rescued them from a terrible famine by his dreams and getting them prepared in advance for what God was bringing. But memories can be short. For once God was seen as a rescuer, now God's people are seen as a threat. Joseph's family had come to Egypt as a place of refuge. There was a terrible famine throughout the area. Now, generations later, they are slaves in that same land. It makes me wonder, just in passing, how we feel or how we treat those who come to our nation as a place of refuge. There's uh, huge uh, issues, isn't there, about migration, uh, uh, but it is a reality that some people do have to still flee their homes because of economic problems, because of famine, like uh, the Israelites had faced, and they end up coming to our nation. Do we hear echoes in this narrative, I wonder, of attitudes and fears that continue to haunt our society and many other societies still today? It's quite remarkable, isn't it? We delve into the Bible, we think this is an ancient story that's maybe just suitable for children, and actually it has such echoes into our contemporary problems that we face today. We face a new king 
who comes to power in Egypt. And we're told to whom Joseph meant nothing. How short memories can be. For once God's people had been the source of rescue, now they mean nothing to the king of Egypt. How quickly do we forget when God has rescued us and instead focus on our next great fear? We can understand, I suppose, why the Egyptians were in a place of fear, why they were concerned. The future of Egypt could be threatened if a large number of people were to thrive in their land and organise against them. The Bible states the problem. They will become even more numerous, the king states. And if war breaks out, we'll join our enemies, fight against us, and then leave the country. A military and economic disaster awaited Egypt if they did not deal with the problem of the Israelites amongst them. At first, the Israelites were oppressed with forced labour or slavery. But verse 12 tells us that but the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. In this story, I wonder who has power. And what does that mean for us? When we first read the story, we might think, well, it must be the Egyptians who have power. They, after all, have a king, have an army, have a, a very strong country and an empire, whereas the Israelites are refugees and powerless and enslaved. It looks from our first reading that the Egyptians are of all the power and the people of God are powerless. I wonder if in some of the situations we face, we can feel equally powerless. And I suppose part of the beginning story of Exodus is the um, psychological state, the mental state of those who are enslaved. Slavery is not just a physical issue of not being able to do what you don't want to do. It's not just an economic issue of not being paid justly for the work you're putting in. It's also a psychological issue of believing you are less than those who have the power over you. Or believing that somehow your life is worth less than others around you. Our context may be very different. We're not facing uh, slavery, I hope and pray. But nonetheless, we can feel, we can live with this psychological uh, problem of thinking we're imbalanced here. Others have got the power. Others have got the gifts. Others have been blessed by God. And I'm powerless and I'm weak and there's nothing I can contribute to it. I think this is an issue to, to, to bear in mind as we go through Exodus. Who really has the power here? It looks like it's the Egyptians. With all this power, with all this control then, why is it the Egyptians are dreading the powerless Israelites? There has to be something else going on here, doesn't there? Than just what we're seeing on the surface. Because on the surface, it looks like the people of God are pretty well doomed. They're certainly in prison. They're facing increasingly harsh conditions. How are they going to survive? And yet it's the people with the power who have the fear. This is interesting. With harsh forced labour not working, another solution to this vexing problem is considered. And it can only be described as infant genocide. I'm sorry, it's a horrific topic to bring up on a Sunday morning. But sometimes when we come to the Bible, the stories are not quite as uh, sweet as we initially thought they were. Because the story of Moses in a Moses basket is not just one for toddler groups. It's a harsh issue here of him having to be rescued from otherwise being murdered. The Hebrew midwives, whose names I'm not going to attempt to pronounce because I'll get them wrong, are given clear instructions. Kill every male baby. Verse 17, we're told the midwives, however, feared God and do not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. Now that's interesting. They're breaking the law. They're doing what's illegal. They are, by not carrying through the king's orders, risking their very own lives in order to save other people's lives. It's brave and it's really quite amazing because it seems to thwart, it seems to put a right spanner in the plan that the Egyptians had. We might then ask ourselves, why are the Egyptians having such a bother with the Israelites? The Israelites are growing in number. Forced labour only appears to aid their increase in spread. 
The policy of infant genocide comes unstuck almost immediately. It is the Egyptians who are left fearing this potential enemy within. To understand what's going on here, we need to actually backtrack a little bit to Genesis chapter 12. And in Genesis chapter 12, we get the first of a, a number of promises that God makes. And he makes this promise to Abraham. And he gave Abraham a promise. He said to Abraham, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. Now, this was to Abraham as an individual, but also to the generations that followed on from him, the people of Israel. And when God says, I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. We begin to see this played out here, aren't we? And as we go through Exodus, we're going to see this more and more. The more the Egyptians try to crush and destroy the Israelites, the more God will turn against them. This is a context that provides the start of the exodus or the exit or departure from Egypt. Now, as we start Exodus chapter one, things look bleak, bad and bleakly bad for the people of Israel, the Israelites. They have been promised a nation, yet they have no land. They have been promised a great nation, but they are slaves in Egypt. They have been promised that God will bless them, but now it looks like their very future is about to be wiped out through this policy of infant genocide. It looks bad for the people of God. And then into this situation, a baby is born. In the midst of this appalling, awful situation, this baby is not only born, but is placed in a basket. We still call them Moses baskets today, don't we? And is rescued. And as a result of this rescue, will be brought up by his own mother in the royal household. It seems a very curious incident, doesn't it? That this one baby should be rescued and rather bizarrely is rescued into the royal household. So where this powerless Israelite should have been destroyed, he's instead put into the center of power in Egypt and allowed to thrive and live. In the birth of Moses, we are reminded too of the birth of Jesus. Jesus was sent by God into the midst of a terrible situation. The people of Israel were once again oppressed, not this time by the Egyptians, but by the Romans. They were in their own land, but it wasn't really their own land, was it? The people were waiting. I've been waiting so long, many had given up, waiting a Messiah, waiting a rescuer from God. And shortly after Jesus' birth, Israel at that time declared that all infant males were to be murdered. You can understand why we don't tend to talk about that so much in the Christmas story, but it's a, a distinct spoiler and things, but that is the harsh reality of where Jesus was born into. As a result, Jesus and his family were forced to flee Israel and go to where for refuge? Go to Egypt. There's one or two points I think are, are worth taking away this morning as we uh, reflect on this story, as we wonder where God is leading us today. First thing to remember, God keeps his promises. That first covenant or promise was made with Abraham and God would keep that. That's why the Israelites are, are, are seemingly so difficult for the Egyptians to deal with. What should have been a, a relatively straightforward thing to, to weaken the Israelites so much they were no longer a threat, they, they just seem to be keep, like rubber bouncing back because God will keep his promises. As followers of Jesus. We know that God has continued to make and keep his promises. In Jesus' death and resurrection, Jesus said that there was a new covenant, a new promise being made from God, that all who believe in Jesus and accept him as Lord will receive forgiveness and eternal life. However bleak things may look, and certainly over the past weeks and months, things have looked pretty bleak at times, God keeps his promises. Now, whether it's a pandemic or a personal situation or a work situation, sometimes we face very bleak situations in our lives. We need to remember that God keeps his promise. 
and that new covenant that Jesus brings in will one day be fully fulfilled. When evil looks like it's got the upper hand, don't forget God keeps his promises and what looks a straightforward job for evil to win really and never will be. I think the other thing to bring forth this morning is that, that God's people have a long history of facing extremely tough times. Now, if as a follower of Jesus, you're thinking, well, it's all about the blessings, it's all about getting to heaven, it's all about the good things, then I'm afraid to say, until we get to heaven, until we die, until Jesus comes back, um, it's not good news at all, actually. Actually, following Jesus, for many of Jesus' followers today, is just a terrible thing, a living nightmare, one would say. There are harsh days being faced by Christians in many, many parts of the world, not just brought on by epidemics, but brought on by, by rubbish regimes, by, by all sorts of false stuff coming their way. But they keep their hope because Jesus declares that God keeps his promises. Until Jesus returns, God's people bear witness to the reality of evil and the deny of freedoms, rights, and even life today. The Egyptian king, was not the first to try and extinguish God's people. And sadly, he's not the last. What should we do? Well, I think as we pray and as we consider our giving and our support, we need to remember Christians facing suffering and persecution today. We have very blessed circumstances at the moment. We need to remember those in other contexts that are facing severely different and difficult times. Let's make sure we're supporting the work of organisations who are working in some of these very difficult places. Let's pray for the suffering church and for organisations who seek to help Christians today. I think too, from this beginning of the Exodus story, and we're only beginning a, a journey that will, after all, take quite a while. Um, we need to see beyond our immediate circumstances. It's very easy when we're in very difficult circumstances to be almost immersed in it, to almost I don't think worship the circumstances is the right word, but just to think about it all the time, to meditate on it all the time, to worry about it all the time, to, to really get enormously uh, caught up in it. And it's almost like there's a need to step back and say that despite the immediate danger and threat and difficulty, God has this big promise. Our promise is that in Jesus, all this evil, all this terrible stuff has been dealt with on the cross. The war is won, and while the battles may rage and may seem to dominate, we need to step back from the battle and see that the war is won, the victory is Jesus, and he invites us to share in that victory. These days may be tough for us. How can we hold on to God's promises and God's truth? And so we have, at the start of this Exodus journey, a baby born and a baby rescued from the Nile in a Moses basket, literally, and in a very strange twist, this baby will grow up as part of the royal household. We're going to investigate this journey further next week, uh, and, and we'll see how God uh, uses Moses to rescue his people, despite a whole series of setbacks that Moses faces personally. In Moses, God has sent a rescuer. And, and I see, and I hope you do, some parallels here with the rescuer God sent us in Jesus as well. However dark it may look, light is coming. However hopeless things may feel, hope is coming. Uh, whatever is facing us, God keeps his promises. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for the story of Moses. It makes actually quite difficult reading as we investigate it. But we thank you that as you kept your promise to the people of Israel, so you keep your promises to us too. You are faithful. And we thank you for that new covenant, that new promise you made to us through Jesus, your son, who died on the cross to defeat evil, to defeat sin, and to offer us forgiveness, hope, and new life. The war is won, and we celebrate that. And yet we still are very conscious of the difficult battles that we face until Jesus returns that we're called home. We pray particularly for Christians who are, are suffering today because uh, their countries, the people around them, uh, are so against what you stand for and what you, uh, what you mean. Please be with them. Please strengthen them. 
And please lead all of us to trust in your promises today and indeed each day. For we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Keith. Welcome back, everyone. We're going to close our gathering this morning with a bit more musical worship. Um, while we're doing this, uh, we're going to try something a bit new. We, I'd like you to try and use the chat, for, chat facility uh, with YouTube to, to maybe type some words of thanks and praise to God as we sing this first song. And then between the two songs we're going to finish with, we'll read some of those out as an act of worship. So if you want to get your phone or something ready to, to type in the chat as we sing, that would be great if you'd like to join in with that. Jesus, you're the hope I cling to, tower that I run to, Savior ever near. Radiant light within my darkness, faithful in my weakness, God who strengthens me. Lead me, take me ever deep. Show me all the riches of its mystery. Trying to find the top. 
<laughs> Thank you, God, for carrying us through these tough times. Thank you, Lord, for no matter what we face, we never face it alone. Thank you, God, for that. Thank you, God, for a wonderful day yesterday, a walk in the sunshine and a triple crown. I don't know what that is. <laughs> Dear God, thank you for rescuing us. Please help us to trust your promises and to know you are always with us. Praise you, Lord. Thank you that you are always with us, whatever we are going through. Thank you for reminding us about this message. Thank you that you set us free from hurts. Thank you, dear Lord, for always being there and with me through good and bad times. Totally trusting the one and only, which is the hope and certainty for everyone. Thank you, God, for your love and healing. Lord, we bring our praise, our worship. The prayers said in people's hearts, the prayers written down, the prayers uh, spoken in people's homes. Lord, as we gather, we are your church here. We bring our worship, our praise, and Lord, we acknowledge that you are the Lord of all and King of kings. We're going we're gonna to sing. I was just thinking we should do that.
That was good. It's good to worship with you guys. Thanks for being with us here. Um, you've walked away, but you need yeah, to do the notice. Yeah, I was going to do the notice about the uh, survey. Thank you so much to everyone who's completed our online survey already. We'd love to hear from you, especially if you're someone who's watched our live stream or is watching it now, but is not a regular part of our church. Maybe you've never been to our church building. Maybe you're not from even around here. But if you've been tuning in, we'd love to hear from you as we plan about how we're going to move at some point back into the church building, we hope, uh, at this year during this year. So if that's you, if you've tuned in, uh, look at the link that is in the comments. It'll be coming up at the end as well. And just fill in the survey. It's just four questions. It won't take you very long. That'd be really useful to us. If you're part of our church membership, there's a different survey for you to fill in. Thanks to loads of people who have filled it in already. But there's still time to fill that in. If you haven't done so, you should have had a link for that in your email. Um, please don't fill in the one for people outside our church if you're part of our church. If members. you've not had a link in let your email know. please let us know on just one of the web on email addresses on the website um we are heading over to the zoom chat so it'd be great if you could join us for uh, some time of prayer and sharing and being able to be church family and the gathered church together um i'm just going to pray for the um us going into this week lord jesus i pray that you will be in our conversations you will be in our um actions this week lord that we will um hear your voice speaking to us and that we will act as you would like us to and um, we pray for um a good week for us lord and we pray for a, a continued good week um in the outlook around the in the country at the moment lord i pray that the uh, virus will continue to be uh pushed into like lower levels and that people will be able to have their vaccinations Lord, and amen. Have a great week, everybody, um, and keep in touch. Bye, everyone.